Welcome back everybody to me talking about the Wheel of Time. <clears throat> and today we're going to go the next bit through the eye of the world. Um, yeah, so buckle up because this one is going to be a bit more critical, I think. Um, for information, this is from chapter 21 to chapter 32. Um, it begins with, I think, listen on the wind, listening to the wind, something like that. And we're ending with um, Four Kings in Shadow. <clears throat> That's chapter 32. So that's where we are today. So, yeah, it's going to be a bit more angry. Cheers. <laughs> All right. So after our big adventure in Shadar Logoth, we are now at the point where our party is split up three ways in the three um, <laughs> most like, you know, problematic combinations. We have one group that's Perrin and Egwene. We have one group that is um, Matt and Tom and Rand. And we have one group that is Nynaeve, um, what's her name? Moiraen, uh, Moiraen, whatever, and Leanne. Anyone, am I the only one who's kind of like confused by how um, in the audiobook Michael Kramer and... Um, Kate Redding are pronouncing Moraine's name differently in the same audiobook. She's like, come on, couldn't you just like actually confer on how to pronounce that if you're recording the thing? I know, I don't know. Not my problem. Well, I mean, I guess it is my problem, but it's not that big of a deal. Anyway, so we have these three groups, and we're going to go through each of them, and I'll tell you why I think some of it is really bad. And then we'll see what we can learn from all of this and why I have not yet um, thrown the book at the wall. Well, to be fair, it's mostly because it's on my phone. And I don't want to throw my phone against the wall because it's the only one I got and it's expensive. <laughs> Apart from that. So let's go. Um, so the first one we're going to look at is... Um, the um, wolves and whatnot storyline of Egwene and Perrin. And that one is the one that really, really, really pissed me off. So maybe it's tactically not the best way to go this way around it, but on the other hand, I... <clears throat> it sort of kind of happens before the other two, sort of, in the... Um, no, fuck that. We're going the other way around. We're going to do Matt and uh, Tom and Rant, and then we're going to do... Um, the the Aes Sedai, the Wisdom and the Water, and um, then we're going to go through that and talk about all the bad parts of the werewolf, well, not werewolf, and uh, tinkers, traveling people, what have you, um, storyline, because holy shit, that stuff's brutal. Anyway, so what do we have? We have really cheap pirate cliches. And remember what I said yesterday about like how crude in a lot of ways descriptions and characterizations are? Yeah, this keeps on happening here and still kind of makes me angry. I mean, even Robert E. Howard, even Conan had better, like less cliche pirates than this one. And I'm, I'm like, maybe someone who has the written book can tell me how much of that is just Michael Kramer um, having smoked too much weed while playing um, Monkey Island, and how much of that is actually um, written in the book, and thus Robert Jordan having played too much Monkey Island. I guess. Because that captain on that riverboat, it's a fucking riverboat, for fuck's sake. I, I should not say that word so much, right? Anyway, <clears throat> it's a fucking riverboat, for fuck's sake, and he talks like the cheesiest Walt Disney pirate I've ever fucking heard. Yar, there are be dragons and shit. Like, come on, motherfucker, be reasonable. It's a river barge. <laughs> I don't know. That just does not sound uh, realistic to me. And at some point, it just uh, it, it felt so ridiculous. It's like, are you trying to write a really cheap comedy here, or is this supposed to be epic fantasy? Because if it's humor, it's shitty humor, and if it's epic fantasy, then, and it's supposed to be atmospheric, it just fails spectacularly, and it's just all completely out of place and out of tone. So, there's that. 
And at the same time, when we come back to like crude characterizations, um, we have the sort of little bit of pe you know tension on that boat, and that is the guy that Rand hmm, punches in the head or jumps in the face of when he jumps on the boar boat, who is obviously evil and bad news, because once again, he's kind of small and wiry and sallow and all of these negative attributes, so we can see that he's bad. And he's whining and complaining all the time, like all the bad guys in these books, in this book so far, are broadcasting their badness, like miles against the wind, and I'm, I don't know, come on. Does it have to be that bad? However, there's some positive things in there, sort of, that I also want to mention. Um, that's, we got some, you know, I mean, this is sort of the training montage chapters, all of them. We have the training montage here, which is Rant and Matt are learning to be uh, gleemen because that's sort of like their cover stories. They, they're they apprentices of Tom, so they learn how to play flute and how to juggle balls and stuff like that. And that kind of, you know, works. And um, is, is a fun, you know, thing because it's, I mean, they're still kids, right? So they got to learn something sooner or later. And it's certainly not, you know, wisdom. <laughs> not in these books. <laughs> It would destroy all the plot if people were suddenly smart. No, um, <clears throat> however, if we go on through this, so we have that whole, like, trip down the river. Most of it is very much without any events. It's uneventful. Um, we just see Matt's paranoia, because apparently, of course, Matt. It, of course, it's always Matt. Matt is basically Peregrine Took, just taller. So he does all the dumb shit, and he stole... He stole a dagger from Shadar Logoth, and now he's getting paranoid and obsessed with it. And luckily, it's not a Palantir, so we're pretty good here on that one. But, you know, it's well, also, once again, it's, I don't know, it becomes more of a crude thing and annoying me later on throughout the book. Um, but here on the ship, it's still kind of okay. The interesting bit, however, is um, the idea that once we reach um, White Bridge, which is sort of where everyone is going, we see the White Bridge. Before that, we see that metal tower, and we have that conversation with the captain that is um, incomprehensible because of his terrible pirate-like dialect all the time. But apparently, there's all kinds of relics of like the age before the breaking of the world. And um, that's... That's something that I appreciate because it means at this point Robert Jordan is no longer stealing from Robert T from J.R. Tolkien, but maybe from Terry by Terry Brooks, uh, stealing from Terry Brooks and Shannara, which, apart from being a really terrible Tolkien ripoff, at least in the first novel, is also post-apocalyptic. And so while it is a fantasy world, there's remnants of a higher technology before that. And uh, yeah, um, that's cool. So I like that. It gives the world a bit more character, right? I mean, sort of, that's sort of where I want to go with, not where I want to go, but what I want to point out here is exactly that. So, once again, if you claim Eye of the World is a Tolkien ripoff, it's not. It is a Tolkien, <laughs> sort of Shannara, <laughs> Arthurian legend ripoff written in sword and sorcery prose. So we have like three influences. That's pretty decent. Even though some of them are like more easily visible than others. But still, you know, we'll see how that continues. And yes, I know it's going to change in the next couple of books. So I'm willing to cut him some slack there. Apart from like Master Fitch in fucking Berlon. That guy gets no slack cut whatsoever. He needs to work on his speech patterns. Immediately. Well, actually, you know, ten chapters back. <laughs> but uh, there we are. So that's like their plot line. They they end up in White Bridge, which has that white bridge that may or may not be a techno uh, technological artifact or what have you. But there's that. And they end up in the, in the town. And... They obviously go into a greasy <laughs> bar, a pub, in that obviously you know already is going to be bad news because it's greasy and dirty and the, the innkeeper seems to be kind of um, sus and everything. It's like everything here is broadcast in five meter high neon letters 
in advance, like chapters in advance. And I, I know it could be done better, and I really, really hope that once Robert Jordan gains the confidence that, yes, this is not going to be a joke. His publisher will actually continue to publish his books even after this mess, um, that he will kind of settle back and actually do things a bit more subtly. That will be that will be really good. I, I, I hope for, like, my sake and your sake that that is the case. We will see, however. So, um, yeah, of course, they go in, they talk about it. Tom gives um, give them, like, his... Um, sort of speech of, like, come with me down to wherever, become Gleeman, forget all those Aes Sedai, they're bad news, you know it, I know it, I'll also tell you my backstory about, like, how you're basically like my nephew who got killed by the Aes Sedai, so he gives them that sob story as a bit of motivation, but, you know, fine. I've heard worse when it comes to character motivation in this book already, so we're good. And, of course, at that point, they need to flee because... The, the evil guy from the boat has marched straight into this specific bar and is talking all about it and dark friends and all of that stuff. So they need to flee, but not before they hear about the fact that A, a murderer is in town, and B, someone who is very suspiciously like... Padan Fane, everyone's favorite um, hook-nosed merchant, um, who seems to be running around and doing whatever, behaving strangely and still looking for them. How Padan Fane, on foot, was able to walk from Berlin to Whitebridge while the others had horses and river barges that were at least as fast as horses is and it still arrived days before, two days before, those guys, um, uh, Matt and Rand and uh, Tom, is something that you guys who actually look at the map can maybe explain. Otherwise, I guess we'll have to do some necromancy or just give up. It just happens to be so. So we have an omen and a threat is building up. So yeah, we have that, and uh, they flee, and as soon as they like climb out of the side window of the bar, they meet the murderer. And uh, Tom gets his you shall not pass um, moment, and gets into a fight with the murderer, and Matt and Rand flee the fools um, with all of um, Tom's stuff. So... That's sort of what happens, and they leave, and, you know, all of that. I mean, that part, like, as plots go, is not too bad. It's a bit, you know... <sighs> Does it have to be Pat and Fane again? Also, how dumb are Matt and Rand that they can't remember that bit? I mean, it's Rand who, t who spoke with Pat and Fane in Berlin. All of... Berlin? Brilon? Ber Berlin, I think. Um, see, I'm already forgetting that kind of shit. Anyway, <clears throat> they spoke together, so I... Well, when we already established that Rand Altor is maybe not the sharpest knife in the drawer, probably duller than his sword, which is totally in his not dad's sword. Um, anyway, so we established that already. So they walk out and they start to make their way to Camlin. Camlin? Camlin. Um, which, I don't know, makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, it kind of makes sense because they wa still want to go on to Tarvalin and to get I guess, um, castrated by, um, neutered, <laughs> neutered by Aes Sedai. I guess that's sort of the plan. Who knows? Um, and they do work their way, um, through, um, along the street. Everything is dark and grim and winter is still there and Matt gets more paranoid by the minute. I mean, yes. And that totally has nothing to do with that dagger that he's always fingering. Have I, have I mentioned how he's fingering that dagger all the time? Um, even more so, and whatnot. Yeah, he is. And then suddenly they realize that um, they could just actually play the instruments and juggle, because, you know, Tom taught them, and that's pretty cool. So that's what they do, and that leads us to that last big encounter. There's, like, one before that that I'll hold back for, like, a final analysis of these parts of chapters. Um, but there's that one thing um, when we come to chapter 32, I guess, which is those four kings in shadow. 
And we need to talk once again about crudeness here, and uh, that's sort of what I want to do. Right? So, remember how all the villages are beautiful and picturesque and shit like that? They are always, every single time. Whether it's fucking Emmons Field, where all the good wives are washing the b and putting and airing the beds and whatnot, and all the good husbands are jumping around on the roofs and hopefully not breaking their necks and whatnot. It's the same here. They're all farmers' cottages, and that's beautiful, despite the grayness and the lingering winter and whatnot. Ain't it fun? And then they come to Four Kings, which is evil and dark and grim and you can tell because everything is dirty it's i mean it's a crossroad and it has like sort of the feel of a western boom town i guess but once again it's like there's no nuance there like there's a village like villages like those are mixed places but not there it's like you go to four kings and it's basically one saloon and one brothel next to the Next to the uh, to the others, um, next to one and oh, I'm I'm losing my language skills today. Anyway, it's one next to the other, and everyone is always rushing around. They're all angry, grumpy, and all are sh you know sallow faced and pale and unhappy because this is an evil place, and the evils of capitalism that are totally different from the evils of capitalism when it's when it's conservative and rural are visible here. Like, that's not how that shit works, for fuck's sake. Um, almost never. <laughs> At least not with a long established town township like Four Kings, right? Your western boom towns work like that, but they're basically something that you break up after a year when the oil is tapped out. Not this. No, sir. This has been here for a long time because that's just how that is. So we go there. They go to another one of those really crude things, which is the bar, like the, the, the dancing cart or the happy cart, or whatever, that guy, that place where the barman is the first thin innkeeper they encounter. See, Robert Jordan is able, is capable of irony and self-irony and self-awareness when he wants to. He just doesn't want to most of the time. So, yeah. We have that place where everyone, where every serving person, every serving woman, a serving girl, is sexually harassed and punched in the face by the landlord, and they still think it's a good idea to actually work for that guy tonight, to actually, even though it's very clear that he wants to rob them, and all of that. So they do that. Fine. Once again, it's like, why does the evil guy have, the bad guy, have... Like, he has a bar, and it's dirty, and there's no one in there, and it's dark, and it's grimy. You know it's fucking evil. It's like, <sighs> I mean, you know, that may, that pisses me off so much. It's like, we were further along. We, we should be able to understand that sometimes evil does not come in either um, displays of poverty, which has its whole own, you know, viper's nest of terrible consequences, if that's what you think you're doing when you're, you know, broadcasting um, evil by showcasing poverty, or, like, evil being shown as, I don't know, greasy, rich, and effeminate, which is the other type of evil that we see here. Case in point, the dark friend that shows up, I ever forget his name, something, something gold, gold or gold. Uh, Michael Kramer is sounding a bit indistinct in the audiobook, and that's all I have. So, that guy shows up, and he's, he's your typical effeminate um, evil, which, once again, is the problem. It's like, you have two types of evil in this book. One of them is coded as poverty, the other one is coded as um, um, effeminacy. That's not good. That's what I'm saying here, right? Um, I hope I don't have to expand it right now. It might be worth looking at that in a separate video once we get further along, because so far this is all just anecdotal evidence. Um, <clears throat> so we do that, and at the end of it, they're, like, locked in the back door. The dark friend talks to them and does all the, like, come with me and do, uh, uh, become all evil and whatnot. And then lightning strikes and blows out the back wall. Right after, Rant Alpore is thinking that they need to do something. 
And this is kind of where we're hitting a problem of like timelines if I go the way that I'm doing it right now, but I feel that's sort of what we need to do. So, jump back to Listens to Wind. No, that's uh, that's the uh, cliche character in the Dresden Files, which we are not talking about here. For that, you have to go to Cal's um, Really Good and Kind channel and to our Dresden discussions with Cal and John and me. Um, <laughs> do that. It's worth it. Subscribe to Really Good and Kind. He's got amazing content. Um, anyway, uh, what was I going to say? Yes, um, Nynaeve hooks up with uh, Moraine and Lan, and Moraine tells Nynaeve that, shocker, the, the, <laughs> the village witch is able to do magic. Um, but Nynaeve has always been denying that. We'll, we'll have like a discussion on like these implications on like how religion and magic work in... Um, or don't work in the Wheel of Time cultures um, at a later date. But she has been denying that, but now Moraine forces her to accept it. And what we learn is that people that use magic for the first time, untrained, will get a headache a day later. And maybe even a bit of a fever. Now we can think about a couple of instances where that has happened, I assume, where people intuitively, like, did something and it sounded almost too good to be true and then people had a headache it is called foreshadowing and you go back to that Berlon chapter Berlon Brelon see i want to say Brelon because Brelon was a dnd campaign that i ran like ages ago in the village there was called Brelon no, not the village. One of the characters, one of my player characters, players' characters were called Brelon. And I always want to use that name. It's also a village that I had to um, spend an inordinate amount of time at the train station at strange hours. Uh, anyway, my point is it's Berlon. I'll just agree on that for now. That village. You go back to that chapter and uh, fuzzy-headed, wool-head um, Randall Tor, maybe? Remember what I said before about um, the whole thing when suddenly his draft horse became a racehorse? Um, once um, his uh, childhood girlfriend sat on it? Well, well, well. That's... I'm just, you know, pointing this out right now. <clears throat> As deftly done foreshadowing in very broad strokes, hammered in with a fucking sledgehammer. But to be fair, and I want to, I want to be fair here, it is handled in a, you know, decent way. We have the events first, then we get an explanation, but not we don't give that explanation to um, the character in question. We give it to someone else, so we, the readers, can figure it out and see. Ooh, maybe something happened there, and uh, you know. That's how you can do that, and I'm I'm not going to give Robert Jordan shit for that. It's a bit on the nose in the future, but this one is this is decent, right? This is not bad. It's it's decent. So there we are, and then they then they you know ride down the the river, following Matt and Rand and Tom to Whitebridge, which is in ruin, but no one wants to talk to them, so. They um, go to the same bar, which is not burnt down, because apparently the Murd Roll and Tom in there, like, um, did not fall down the bridge of Casa Doom, but on the other hand, uh, burnt down half of White Bridge, which, you know, fine, I guess. And they decide to leave and, um, you know, find out what's going on with the third group, which is... Um, Perrin and Igwain. What else to be there to be said? Like I appreciate once again, Nynaeve is probably the best the best character so far in this book is Nynaeve. She does have her problems. Uh she's not a perfect character or anything, but at least switching perspective so we get her like viewpoint and some of her thoughts, even though it's all like very much like, you know, still omniscient third person and whatnot. But it's actually makes it better, makes it a bit more refreshing. She has motives. They are actually good motives. She actually does have motives, which is way more than, say, Rand or Perrin later on have. They're like, oh, we'll just, like, do something. I mean, you, you know, they're 16-year-old boys. When I was 16, my goals in life were um, get beer and listen to punk rock, which are good motives. I, I, gain, I mean, you know, <laughs> 
for what they are. <laughs> I've not exactly progressed far from that. But um, she actually has like motives, she has morals, she has goals, she wants to achieve something, which is get those kids back. She takes her job seriously. That's an actual character with, you know, <laughs> character. So good for Nynaeve, bad for Moraine, because what we see here is the thing that we have seen before in this book. Which is, people are not talking to each other, and uh, that's something that, you know, works to drive story. It's something that, you know, is realistic, because let's face it, we also don't talk to each other merely enough in everyday things. Which is why we, which is partly how we ruin relationships, jobs, <laughs> the, the fucking internet, by not talking to each other. So I'm, I, you know... I'll not give him shit for that. I'll just say it's a bit overdone because it happens all the fucking time. But we have, you know, Lan and Moraine, and there's some some sort of tension building up with Nynaeve and Lan, where Nynaeve is doing all these Mandy things, which is like tracking and stuff, and surprising Lan because she's so good at it, because, oh gosh, women can do boy things. But then again, I mean, this is written in like 84 uh, to 90, 1990, and yeah, that's... It's not progressive, for fuck's sake, but it is at least something. And in a world that is otherwise very much focused on, like, gender roles and shit, having a character that is at least capable of doing something else than just braid tugging is... It's pretty neat. So, once again, favorite character so far, Nynaeve. Best one, definitely. By a long fucking shot. Anyway, they all join up there. Uh, Nynaeve has accepted that she will learn magic and she's going to do it for, um, well, she's going to do it to take down Moraine because Moraine fucked with her job as village wisdom, which, fair enough. Once again, I said that she actually does have, like, motivations, which is more than anyone else has shown so far. So, let's go to the last one, which is the worst. Perrin and Egwene decide to go straight over overland to Camelin. Because Perrin decides it's smarter to do that than to follow the river. Because there might be people following the, the river to actually catch them. So yeah. Bonus points for having a thought with Perrin. Perrin is another one of those like super broad stroke characters. Yeah, he's tall and big so and slow. And people think he's stupid, which he obviously is not. But we have to point that out like every other sentence. And then we have the boy-girl dynamic with Perrin and Egwene, where Egwene is bossing around poor Perrin because he's not able to do anything about it, but he also feels that he should he should be in charge. Like, I don't know, man. I mean, they're no longer 13. <laughs> and the fact, like, how, how that, I don't know. It just feels so... So frustratingly crude and ridiculous because we never get like any actual like reasons. It's like, yeah, and then Egwene just looked at him and firmed her jaws and he was no longer able to tell her what to do. And she also didn't see sense because I don't know why. And it's fucking frustrating is what it is. So that's what's going on there, and then they raid, and obviously they get lost, but like, luckily they meet the wolf guy, which is a really cool character, so we have, um, and this is sort of, you know, like, the other part of this storyline is, and the, and we, oh, we're, go we're going to go into that in a second. So we meet the wolf guy, Elias, who uh, runs with wolves, does hate civilization and humans, and can communicate with wolves. It's not as much, I mean, could that be inspiration for what happens in Game of Thrones? Possibly. I know that George R. R. Martin liked Robert Jordan's work, so there's that. Um, I'll just point it out. Um, point is, um, and he claims that Perrin can also talk to wolves, and Perrin's, Perrin is like, no, of course not, I can't do that. And then he does, and it, it's part of like him trying to come to ter terms with that, which all of that is fine. That's a solid, you know, fantasy story. It's not incredibly unique or what have you. But it it, it works, that bit. We're kind of beyond the really dumb Egwene parent conversations and, like, dynamic until we reach the Tinkers. And now we need to have us a serious conversation. All right. 
Um, now, I know this book is a bit older, it's 30 years old, but the traveling people are a terrible cliche and a dangerous one at that. And like, you remember when I spoke about um, how you can read Pat and Fain as a Jewish stereotype and thus an anti Semitic uh, stereotype? Now we have an anti Siganist, um, uh, well, however you pronounce that, um, stereotype or more of them. And this is a problem. So they come, um, the traveling people are, you know, reviled by everyone as stealing children and whatnot. The typical thing that we have with uh, Roma, Sinti, and all the other traveling people in Europe. And um, then we, then he goes, and he's like, yeah, but they're, they're really not like that. And he's, he flips it to all those positive, like, discrimination kinds of things, which is, oh, they're all, like, in tune with whatnot, they're a bit spiritual, they're, like, all musical, and they love, they like to dance, and sensual, they're also sensual, and this is the dangerous part, like, the other dangerous part of it, and that comes with the conversation, or, like, the introduction of character, a character named Aram, Aram, I think it's Aram, <laughs> maybe something else, anyway, that guy shows up, and, like, really hits on Egwene immediately. Like, within the second page, I guess, five minutes of audiobook, he hits on Egwene, and she falls for him immediately. And this is this is really, really dangerous and problematic when it comes to these stereotypes, because that's exactly how a lot of um, uh, racist stereotypes work, whether it's people of color or in, like, Europe, I guess, at this point, it's mostly people from the Middle East that are, like, targeted by... The, the idea that those foreign people will come here and steal our, steal away all our good white women. Cliché. Because they're a bit more animalistic and what... That's a terrible fucking cliché. It's a, a, a terrible stereotype that is so much built into all these forms of racism. To see that in here, just, like, without any irony, without any awareness, it's exactly what happens immediately. Just made me super fucking angry. It's like... Why is no one calling Robert Jordan out for that shit? That should not be in there. We should not do anything like that. It goes beyond the... Beyond just the, oh, look, all those traveling people, they're just all very, very happy, and they're not really stealing all the time. But they're, like, all about music and dancing and all the passion and whatnot. It goes beyond that, because that's exactly where, like, actual racist violence comes from, when suddenly you have people attacking people of, like, a different ethnic group, because they fear for, like, they have some of those, like, atavistic, I need to defend my tribe bullshit emotions. But that's exactly what you fuel with stories like that, and I'm so pissed off by this. Sorry. I'm getting a bit emotional here, I guess. So please, please tell me I'm reading this wrong, but I don't think I am. And it really, really annoys me. Because he keeps, it's, it's part of that story. Now, we kind of have the over, like, the parallel here is... Egwene meets Aram. Um, Perrin sees all those um, Tinker girls dancing for him, and he gets he blushes because he's a bit of a shy one. And it kind of is mirrored in Matt's uh, Matt and Rand's storyline when they are at that one farm, and Ra and one of the girls is uh, making eyes is hitting on Rand, and Rand is getting all shy and stuff. And this is this is like doubly like makes me angry again, right? Because so Rand just gets shy when and, and and stays all true to Egwene, <laughs> and is you know all awkward when that girl looks at him. And Egwene, as soon as that guy comes on, is like, "Oh wow!" and goes off with him dancing all night long. <laughs> so what do we learn here? Not only do white women fall for. Um, Tinker boys, because they're good-looking and passionate and whatnot, but also white men have the moral fiber to avoid falling for anything. They're staying true and whatnot. That's just ridiculous and makes me doubly angry. Apart from that, the idea of having both of them, that, that like couple, that loving couple or not loving couple of Rand and Egwene, split up and kind of taste freedom and explore those kind of things is a good idea. It's just ham handled in such a ridiculously bad way that it really, really made me angry. So there we are. 
um, what remains to be said, they leave. There's more to be said about the Tinkers that I can't be bothered right now. I guess we'll hear more of them later on, so I guess we'll keep it for then. Um, they run with wolves, um, we get a crows are chasing you scene that we have totally never seen in Lord of the Rings. Not in the movie, not in the books. But, well, they're ravens, so we're better off, right, I guess. And then they fall into the hands of the Children of the Light, which are not the Spanish Inquisition. And they always turn up where you, where you don't expect them, like in the middle of fucking nowhere. At a steading. So we, f we hear a bit about the Ogiers. That's like actually introduced fairly neatly, the Ogier idea, the idea of Ogiers and the, and the steadings. That's pretty cool. I, I appreciate that. And we get a callback to... Um, King Arthur um, Hawkwind, Hawkeye, Hawkwind, and the statue. The statue has a bit of like an Ozymandias feel to it, which once again is a pretty neat reference if you want to do that. Um, I'm I'm fine with that. And suddenly they show up. There's a battle. Finally, Perrin accepts the wolf, um, sort of, and then ends up in chains with the Inquisition. It's like. Why are they in the middle of fucking nowhere with a hundred people? I don't know. Also, apparently, this is Bornholt's dad. He's also called Bornholt, but with like a surname. So the, the guy that got into a fight with Rand has a dad, and that has now Egwene and Perrin in his hands. So, what do we learn from all of this? And I guess we'll go back to that tomorrow. We split up the group. And each of the boys, at least, has a sort of growing experience, and we, we're getting more of the... They are special. Perrin has a special power. That special power is talking to wolves. Rand is showing signs of having a special power, which may be using magic. Does Matt have one apart from annoying people? I guess we're about to find out, but apparently he also speaks in tongues, so at least he could become a, um evangelical Christian if he really wants to. So there's that. And, yeah. As I said, this really made me angry. The, the, the way he deals with cliches here is just, like, inexcusable. And, uh, yeah. Let me know what you think about all of this, and if I got too agitated. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go on. I'll at least finish that book. We'll see how I feel after that. Um, but that's it for tonight. I'll talk to you tomorrow about more Wheel of Time. Hopefully I've calmed down by then. And, uh, yeah, have a good Wednesday. Cheers. <laughs>